Non is our next speaker. He's presently at Weir and Folds, practicing in the area of civil litigation, professional negligence of discipline, human rights, constitutional administrative law, and labor relations. He's formerly chief commissioner of the Ontario Human Rights Commission and acts presently for complainants and respondents before both the federal and provincial commission. He's also acted as a board of inquiry under the Ontario Human Rights Code. Raj? Thanks very much, Howard. Um, I intend to deal, um, to touch upon um, many of the topics which are covered, I think, in some detail in the paper which you'll find in the materials uh, and in which um, I had um, a great deal of um, assistance uh, from my colleague at Weir and Folds, Tali Golombek, and uh, for which I thank her. In the paper, I deal with uh, uh, new developments in um, two areas, substantive human rights law and procedural um, human rights enforcement. And um, uh, in the time available to me, I intend to uh, try to touch upon the, the major developments. And there have been uh, many major cases at the Supreme Court level and on the substantive side, as well as the procedural side. And there have, there have been uh, a number of new developments, principally, I think, the, um, uh, the uh, task force chaired by uh, uh, former Mr. Justice Laforé, which I'll deal with on the uh, procedural side. Um, probably the major decision of the last year or so, uh, it, uh, was all, uh, a bit more than a year ago. On the substantive side um, is the uh, BC decision, which is referred to uh, as the Murin case, BC um, Public Service Employee Relations Commission against the um, BC Government Service Employees Union, which essentially, at least in principle, merged the concepts of direct and adverse effect discrimination. Uh, why is that important? Uh, discrimination analysis has gone through three stages uh, in uh, our, let's say, North American history. The first, and the one which is, I think um, it's fair to say, still the understanding of um, a lot of people and a lot of um, uh, opinion makers in this country, such as the Globe and Mail, as the only form of discrimination, is direct or intentional discrimination. And uh, that's the, the um, malicious uh, form of discrimination which um, was and sometimes still is uh, characteristic of, um, of um, signs which we found on the beaches in Toronto saying no Jews or dogs allowed and uh, which are still prevalent in practices as they relate to Aboriginal people in terms of housing, for example, and sometimes in employment today. Um, direct, pernicious, uh, malicious discrimination based on the ground in question. The second stage of the evolution was uh, another form of direct discrimination, but one which is perhaps seen as less malicious, uh, but nevertheless has um, a clear negative impact on the victim, and that is paternalistic forms of discrimination. Um, for example, um, preventing women of childbearing years from working in certain occupations or in certain portions of uh, occupations, such as mining, um, on the basis that it was, it was thought that those who ran, who, who ran the place could determine better than the employees themselves whether it was safe for them to be there. Again, direct discrimination, but based not on hatred or malice, but on uh, on perhaps outdated and paternalistic uh, conceptions of um, who should be determining such issues. We go from there to um, adverse impact or adverse effect, which was uh, defined in the Simpson, Sears and O'Malley case almost 15 years ago now, um, as rules, practices, preferences and restrictions that are facially neutral, 
and apply to all employees but have a disproportionate effect on certain employees or groups based on a prohibited ground. And it, you'll all be familiar, I think, with the uh, circumstances of the Simpson Sears case where a salesperson was unable to work Saturdays because of her religious beliefs. Uh, in, indeed, she converted to that, um, to the religion which uh, prohibited her, her from working on Saturdays, and she was told that she would either have to work part-time, she was a full-time employee, or she would have to quit. And the uh, Supreme Court held that an employment rule, Saturday work, which for Simpson Sears was clearly important because a very large proportion of their sales were made on Saturdays, um, made for honestly and for sound economic or business reasons, equally applicable to all to whom it's intended to apply, may yet be discriminatory if it affects a person or group of persons differently from others to whom it may apply. And um, a similar um, principle was applied in the Central Alberta Dairy Pool um, case in 1990 by the Supreme Court of Canada. Um, in 1999, as I say, just over a year ago, the Supreme Court rejected the distinction between adverse and direct discrimination in the BC firefighter case which, um, <clears throat> in which the complainant was Tawny Bjorin. She had been employed as a firefighter for three years and had performed satisfactorily. All BC firefighters were compelled to take a physical fitness test. She failed a component of that test which was meant to measure aerobic capacity. And the evidence was that due to physiological differences, most women have lower aerobic capacity than men, which they cannot change, and that the aerobic standard therefore had a disproportionate negative impact on women <clears throat> as a group. In, in principle, it's not very different from the height and weight requirements which fire, uh, f which fire departments and police departments employed um, a couple of decades ago. Uh, despite the fact that, um, again, there were physiological differences between women and men, and there were physio physiological differences betwe between certain racial groups, which um, put certain groups at a disadvantage because of their lower average height or weight. And again, these were designed to be proxies, essentially, for speed, strength, agility, um, other legitimate um, characteristics or requirements of firefighting uh, or policing. Uh, so in, in, with respect to the uh, firefighter aerobic capacity, a unanimous Supreme Court said that this standard clearly violated Ms. Muren's rights to be free from discrimination on the ground of sex, which I'll discuss in more detail below. Um, but uh, more importantly for present purposes, the Supreme Court uh, fastened on this case to set out some seven different reasons why the distinction between uh, direct discrimination and adverse impact and the different legal analysis which is employed in the two cases um, should be uh, set aside. Now, one has to always bear in mind in reading Supreme Court decisions uh, about human rights, for example, about statutory human rights codes, that every province and uh, and in, uh, territory and the federal jurisdiction have human rights laws, they um, follow upon a highly politicized and uh, visible legislative process. And as a result of that, they don't happen every day. They happen typically after five years or 10 years or spans of that, time, of that kind. Uh, I mean, indeed, in, in Ontario, there haven't been uh, the, the, the last substantive change to the Human Rights Code was in the early 1980s. There have been some changes since then. I mention that because court cases obviously don't follow the same kind of pattern. They happen haphazardly from the standpoint of the court, and they, happen, uh, they can happen at any time, and they can happen in clumps, or they can, uh, they can happen in after uh, long spans of inaction. And so what you get, for example, in this case, is a decision of the Supreme Court supposedly unifying the analysis between direct and adverse impact, and I'll go into how that's done in just a moment. But we have to keep in mind that each jurisdiction has its own statute, and that statute may or may not accord with that Supreme Court analysis. Now, 
Um, we, 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 the same thing happened in 1985 with the Simpson, Sears, and O'Malley case. Um, most statutes simply talked about discriminating on grounds of, and then they're all the prohibited grounds, and didn't talk about direct or adverse impact. The Supreme Court said, if it says you shall not discriminate, that includes uh, adopting a policy or practice which is facially neutral but which has an adverse impact. And so the question then was, does the statute in fact permit that adverse impact analysis or is it restricted in some way? The same thing can be said now of the uh, Mioran case. In principle, um, there is a, a fusion of the um, analyses, uh, but it always has to be subject to the statute in question. To use a somewhat different example, the Robichaux case, as, uh, as we know, in this Robichaux case some time ago, the Supreme Court established um, employer liability for acts done in the course of employment by uh, employees. Well, Ontario had then and has today uh, a section of its code which appears to contradict that analysis. And so the case law has fluctuated back and forth, quite frankly, on whether the Robichaux sweeping in of liability is applicable in Ontario. In the Murin case, and, and there, are, uh, there are now developing cases in various jurisdictions in Canada which apply Murin, the court articulated a new three-step defense for discrimination that combined elements from the BFOR defense, bona fide occupational requirement, defense for direct discrimination and the duty of accommodation defense for adverse impact discrimination. And that was one of the seven reasons that the court gave that there were these different analyses and they, and, and particularly in the area of disability, it was a matter of choice as to whether you took the position that steps into a building were direct discrimination because everybody knows that if it's a public building there will be users who, have, who, who use wheelchairs and can't use the steps or is it adverse impact because steps are neutral? They don't say no people with disabilities need apply or need come in, but you could hardly do a better job. So that kind of um, haphazard analysis resulting in different divergent uh, legal results was one of the things the Supreme Court tried to set aside. The um, court said that an employer could justify a so-called neutral standard by establishing on a balance of probabilities three things. One, that the employer adopted the standard for a rational purpose, that is rationally connected to the performance of the job. Two, that it was adopted in an honest and good faith belief that it was necessary to the job. And third, that the standard is reasonably necessary to the accomplishment of that legitimate work-related purpose. In other words, to come back to the accommodation and undue hardship analysis, it was impossible to accommodate the employee without imposing undue hardship uh, upon the employer. Um, the Supreme Court has decided a number of cases since then and it has, uh, uh, it has uh, bolstered and uh, confirmed the Mioran fusion of direct and adverse impact discrimination. Um, in another BC case involving um, uh, motor vehicle licensing standards for visual disabilities. Um, the court justified the unified test saying that very few standards today discriminate directly um, uh, but that the indirect or adverse impact analysis imposes a less stringent obligation and so it was in, in a sense it was easy for a party which had um, non-discrimination obligations, such as an employer, to do indirectly what it couldn't do directly by imposing a so-called neutral standard, um, such as nine to five work hours or nine to six p.m. work hours uh, on uh, people who, for childcare reasons or for other reasons, needed flexible work hours. You didn't say, mothers with ch small children need not apply, but the, the impact was the same unless there was, uh, uh, unless there was accommodation. Um, 
Let me just uh, quickly survey some of the uh, cases which have been decided on specific grounds before moving to the procedural um, um, developments. Um, sex discrimination. Um, in general, uh, as a prohibited ground, sex refers to gender and the personal attributes attached to each gender. And there are, as you know, uh, a wide number, wide variety of cases which have been decided um, in the employment area under the uh, gender ground. Um, unnecessary physical testing was the Murin uh, case where um, it serves as a barrier to access to non-traditional occupations such as firefighting for women. Um, Discrimination on the basis of pregnancy or pregnancy-related conditions is also prohibited under the ground of sex, and you'll be aware of the uh, Brooks and Canada Safeway decision of uh, more than a decade ago, which originated that area. Um, a, a recent case involving what I called earlier the paternalistic approach to discrimination uh, is the Andover and Perth United Farmers Co-op case which involved an employer dismissing an employee on the assumption that her pregnancy would prevent her from performing her duties. And the decision was very simply, and this is in the last uh, uh, few months, that the decision to dismiss must be based on the employee's actual performance and after an assessment of whether suitable accommodation was possible. The employer was concerned that a grocery clerk would be unable to continue lifting as a result of her pregnancy, uh, and the um, New Brunswick Labor and Employment Board uh, held that th that that was uh, that was to prejudge the issue. Um, another area and a developing area is the is the um, is the meaning of gender identity, um, and a very important, I think, and controversial case. I, I just came back actually from this weekend from the court challenges the Federal Court Challenges Program annual meeting, which was permeated, I think it's fair to say, with um, controversy and dispute about um, whether uh, gender or sex as a ground um, included uh, the um, transgendered issues, as they're called. And, I'll, and the best way, of, I think, of, of um, uh, describing that is to is to cite the case. It's called Vancouver Rape Relief Society against BC Human Rights Commission, and in that case, the uh, this was an application for judicial review by the Vancouver Rape um, Relief Society uh, from a decision of the commission to send a case to a tribunal. And the BC court held that it was within the definition of discrimination on the basis of sex um, for the Vancouver Rape Relief Society to refuse to employ in a volunteer capacity uh, one Kimberly Nixon, a, a post-operative male to female transsexual who is medically and legally a woman. Um, the challenge was on the basis that this did not come within the definition of gender or sex, the rationale of the Vancouver Rape Relief Society was that only a woman who had, frankly, grown up with the experience of being a girl and a woman would understand the relationship between male violence and female inequality such that she could assist in a time of crisis. And there's no doubt that the Vancouver Rape Relief Society would have uh, a uh, justification and an exemption, if you like. Uh, such that they would be permitted to hire only women into certain jobs. Uh, the question was they, whether they could prohibit a person who was legally and medically a woman by virtue of uh, a transsexual operation. The court um, def uh, upheld, and indeed the challenge was made by one of, uh, by uh, a lawyer acting on behalf of the Vancouver Rape Relief Society, who is in fact one of the um, as is the Vancouver Rape Relief Society, a prominent proponent of uh, women's rights. Uh, the application was dismissed, um, and the, the court um, 
did not accept the notion that in prohibiting discrimination on the basis of sex, the legislature intended to deal exclusively with male-female distinctions and did not accept that the absence of gender identity or transsexualism from the Human Rights Code meant that the legislature did not wish human rights to protect transsexuals. And th there's language about the broad and purposive interpretation of human rights codes. Um, disability, uh, the um, cases following Muirin at the Supreme Court have suggested an interpretation, a broad interpretation of handicap that identifies not just the disability itself, but the conversion of the physical limitation into an employment limitation as the problem requiring scrutiny. To put it somewhat differently, perceptions of a, a particular medical or disabling condition are equally problematic as uh, the um, operational impact of the so-called disabling conditions. Use an example, obesity. Uh, uh, that's specifically mentioned in one of the Supreme Court cases as a ground which will permit um, analysis under handicap despite, uh, on the basis that somebody's been refused a job because of obesity or been uh, disadvantaged in his or her job in terms of promotion or, or uh, whatever. Um, even though that uh, obesity does not uh, have a functional impact on the performance of his or her job. The uh, Antrup case in, uh, against Imperial Oil in the Ontario Court of Appeal decided a few months ago uh, uh, confirmed that individuals addicted to alcohol and drugs were protected by the code um, and found that um, Imperial Oil's alcohol and drug testing policy was not reasonably necessary to accomplishing Imperial Oil's uh, purposes. Um, in the paper, I've also dealt with recent cases involving uh, religion, and I, I, won't, um, I won't go over those, those. There are some recent Court of Appeal decisions in that area, as well as um, uh, sexual orientation, and I've uh, cited a case there called Brillinger against um, Brocky. Um, in which um, one of the complainants was in fact a corporation, the Canadian Lesbian and Gay Archives, and it was found to have been discriminated against um, because it was uh, refused printing services on the basis that its um, membership and clientele uh, were largely gay and lesbian people, and that that, oh, that offended the religious sensibilities of the respondent, Brocky, who then refused to provide printing services. So there you have a corporation as complainant under the um, uh, Ontario Human Rights Code. Let me move uh, uh, quickly, if I can, given the time, to uh, procedural matters, and there are some important um, I think some important developments as, uh, outside the courts as well as some important judicial decisions in this area. Um, in terms of developments outside the courts, many of you will be aware of the uh, Canadian Human Rights Act review panel that was uh, formed by the Federal Justice Minister uh, about a year and a half ago and which reported last spring on both uh, the substantive and procedural review of the Canadian Human Rights Act and it's, it, it was a, a very broad-ranging uh, enterprise, this, uh, this panel. Um, I'm only going to concentrate, for, for example, on the substantive side, considering whether social condition or poverty should be a ground under the Canadian Human Rights Act. So it dealt with very fundamental substantive issues. I want to concentrate on, on the procedural aspect. Um, and in that regard, I, I was actually, I was invited to do, after several papers were done for the commission on um, the um, non-functioning of human rights commissions in this country and their role as gatekeepers, in other words, the ability of human rights commissions through investigation and a discretionary decision to determine that even a meritorious complaint should not go to an independent adjudication before a board of inquiry or a tribunal. 
And that is essentially the present state of the law in this country, that human rights commissions have that gatekeeping discretionary function. Um, the analogy was used by one of the sp spokespersons for a group at one of the consultations that I was at, uh, citing uh, a, a, a rental housing tribunal and citing the number of cases in which landlords apply for uh, possession and eviction on the basis of non-payment of rent. That number in Ontario per week is approximately the number of complaints before the Canadian Human Rights Commission in a year. The Canadian Human Rights Commission sends about 2% of its complaints to an independent tribunal for adjudication. And the analogy was put that if I, as a lawyer acting for a landlord, had a landlord walk into my office and say, this is a simple case, my tenant isn't paying rent, I need to have them out. Um, and if I told them, well, we can start a, a complaint, uh, it'll be investigated in a year or two, and at the end of it, uh, assuming your facts are right and the case has merit, your chances of getting a, an independent adjudication are 2%. Uh, as this fellow put it, there would be insurrection in the streets. But we uh, sanction that in the area of human rights, um, which is supposed to be a quasi-constitutional right. And that's, uh, I think it's fair to say, anomalous from the standpoint of complainants and respondents who also want quick, inexpensive, and binding adjudication. So I was, actually, I was asked to provide the task force with um, a model, with, with a, a detailed set of rules and guidelines to provide that. And what I provided was essentially a labor board kind of model, keeping in mind the distinctions between a labor, bo labor board where there are mostly relatively equal parties, unions and employers on the one side, and a human rights commission where there are vast uh, inequalities between complainants and respondents in terms of representation and otherwise. Um, and so the, the, the Labor Board model is essentially file a complaint and get a hearing. And when I was head of the Human Rights Commission in this province, I heard from uh, complainants groups, respondents groups, and all of them said much the same thing, which is get this case to a fast hearing. And hearing doesn't necessarily mean um, calling uh, 15 days of evidence, including expert evidence on what is discrimination, which tends to be one of the unfortunate uh, uh, pre prevailing uh, events at some of these boards of inquiry, but rather, just like a labor board or other administrative tribunals, getting at a conclusion on the merits uh, quickly through summary judgment, through um, pleadings motions, through um, uh, um, uh, dismissal on the basis of time or other available grounds, uh, not necessarily full-scale hearings and v viva voce testimony, but rather a determination that the complaint has merit or does not. And that is not the conclusion at the end of about 98% of human rights complaints. They're either settled, which is commendable, or there is a decision not to take it to a board of inquiry or a tribunal, which is not an adjudication on the merits. Um, the uh, task force has essentially adopted that model in its recommendations, and um, once uh, the election is over and once there's a government in place, uh, we'll see what the federal uh, government does with those recommendations, which were made by a very, I would say, with respect, a very illustrious panel, including not only former Justice Laforé, but um, Professor Bill Black, who uh, has uh, been instrumental in uh, reforming the BC human rights legislation, um, and um, Harish Jain, who's a professor known to many of you at McMaster University. Um, the, uh, I, I'll just cite, cite for you a couple of important cases um, uh, that, I, that you might want to know about. The Payne against Ontario Human Rights Commission case, which was decided earlier this year by, the, by a majority, a two to one decision of the Ontario Court of Appeal, was actually a motion to compel the testimony of persons who were present at a Human Rights Commission meeting, which was held to decide whether Stephanie's, uh, Stephanie Payne's complaint would go to a board of inquiry. And as, as m most of you will know, the Human Rights Commission does not hold hearings in the sense that it never meets complainants or respondents. The commissioners, 
decide whether a case is dismissed, that is, nothing further is done with it, or it goes to a board of inquiry, or a settlement is approved on the basis of paper that is put before it. Um, <clears throat> by my count, when I was there, it involved approximately six minutes of consideration per file on average. Um, and um, clearly, um, recommendations and, um, and um, uh, statements made by staff members. And the Payne case concerned, um, in fact, involved an affidavit of a former commissioner, that is, an ordering council appointee, who deposed to the fact that staff statements at these meetings were very influential, and needless to say, the parties never, never heard them and never had access to an opportunity to rebut them because the parties are not there. The commission decides 30 or 40 cases in the course of a day or perhaps two days in meetings which it holds roughly once a month. Um, the the um, Payne case permitted uh, a witness to be examined under uh, Rule 39, I think it is, on a pending judicial review application um, within limitations. Uh, it's not simply by filing a judicial review application that you get the right to examine uh, a series of, um, of uh, adjudicators and their, and their witness and the, their uh, staff. Uh, so um, Justice Sharp for the um, Ontario Court of Appeal set down some uh, guidelines in that area. Um, in the area of, uh, I'll just deal with two last cases. The, the Supreme Court last month decided um, the Blanco case, which involved a BC cabinet minister who was accused of sexual harassment by uh, uh, members of his staff, and um, uh, in respect of whom it took about 30 months from the date of the complaints to uh, determine whether they should go to a hearing. The majority of the Supreme Court, and the, the issue was, did that delay violate his rights under Section 7 of the Charter, the right to life, liberty, and security of the person, and the right not to be deprived thereof, except in accordance with the principles of fundamental justice? Um, or did, it, um, did that delay, under more conventional administrative law principles, um, uh, justify the dismissal of the complaint and the to, in, in, a, in a, an oversimplified nutshell the administrative law and the human rights jurisprudence and needless to say there have been lots and lots of delay cases before the courts and before human rights boards of inquiries and tribunals is that a complaint will not be dismissed for delay unless the delay is such as to uh, prevent a fair hearing that is, essentially, it would be an abuse of process to permit this to go forward because, for example, the delay has resulted in a, a, prime, a prime witness dying uh, in the meantime or uh, has resulted in destruction of documents or something of that sort. The Supreme Court, the majority decides that there was no Section 7 violation and that there was no administrative law violation to the extent that the complaint should be dismissed and adopts that human rights board analysis, plus it says that if the delay is uh, so significant as to be, these are my words, shameful and beyond um, uh, any reasonable limits, then uh, a court can strike down the complaint, but it focuses on the interests of all parties, complainants, respondents, and the public, because essentially Blanco's case is a fight between him and the commission and the innocent complainants played no role in the BC Court of Appeal decision which struck down the compl their complaint and prevented them from going forward. Uh, the um, Canadian Telephone Employees Association against Bell Canada case, this is the latest saga in I think about 14 judicial reviews in this Bell Canada pay equity dispute, um, is the latest uh, word on uh, institutional bias, whereby courts have looked at uh, the institutional characteristics of a tribunal, in this case the Federal Human Rights Tribunal, 
to determine whether it is sufficiently independent of the government and the parties to give a fair hearing. And as many of you will know, Madam Justice McGillis's earlier decision uh, essentially struck down the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal um, on grounds that, um, for example, the commission, the Canadian Human Rights Commission, which appears before the tribunal, had the statutory authority to set per diems for not only commissioners, but for tribunal members. So you had essentially the prosecutor deciding the pay of the judge. Uh, that was one of the grounds. I won't go into the further grounds. The legislation was amended. This is now the adjudication under the Bill of Rights of the amended legislation. And Madam Justice trombley Lemaire strikes it down, at least in that case, on similar grounds under the Bill of Rights. And basically she says that, that the Commission's power to issue binding guidelines and the, com the, cha the chair of the tribunal's power to um, allow a tribunal member to continue after the expiry of his or her term, uh, render it a tribunal which is not sufficiently independent in keeping with the guidelines on judicial independence which uh, the court has established in other cases. Uh, I have been told repeatedly that my time is up, so I will sit down. Thank you. Thank you. All of the speakers today are, if they're able to, dependent on their calendars, are invited to stay to the end where we're going to have a half hour question and answer period for everyone. Chris Pellier, who I think I saw, ah, he's walking up, is a senior partner in Gowling's Toronto office. He actually worked for a number of years with Justice Gouge, who is going to be here tomorrow. I first met him when I was a youngest student at U of T Law School. And Chris was one of my teachers who then came in with Ian Scott to teach us advanced civil procedure. He's been acting for, I guess, more years than I then on behalf of trade unions and individuals. He also succeeded in the Kirkpatrick case before the Court of Appeal. And if he has a minute, maybe he can tell us about whether or not Gans is right in suggesting there's still some room for summary judgment. Thanks, Howard. Um, let me just say hello. And uh, to comment on Justice Gans's point, I wasn't here this morning, but I uh, wholeheartedly agree with Justice Gans if he said that there is room to bring applications for summary judgment in wrongful dismissal cases. Uh, I am, with all due respect to Justice Borens, firmly convinced that the Kilpatrick case is dead wrong on that procedural ground. And secondly, I am of the view that if that case, type of case gets before the Court of Appeal, that, um, that Kilpatrick will not survive. Uh, I just think it's, uh, it's just completely wrong and has caused a whole lot of difficulty in the employment law area where uh, it was common for people to bring applications for summary judgment simply because you had a difference of opinion about what the appropriate period of notice should be, and you could go before a court, and each of you could pitch your case in an hour, and the court would say 14 months, 16 months, eight months, and you're on your way. So uh, I encourage people to uh, not pay attention to Kilpatrick unless you really have a major issue with respect to factual issues that are in dispute. For example, if you were trying to rely on the Wallace factor, you might have a hard time, I would think, on an application for summary judgment because the issues in dispute will be one that will inevitably lead to a difference between the parties as to uh, what was said, how was the person terminated, and what the effect of that should be. So I wouldn't necessarily do it in that kind of a case. But uh, So having missed what he had to say, I, I would encourage people to to, to do that. And did he mention that there are at least two cases that have not followed um, Kilpatrick, one of which is a decision of Justice Spence, and um, the other, I know, is a decision that Eric Murray acted for the applicant on, 
and that uh, may have been uh, John Jennings. I think it was Justice Jennings. So those are two that you can look at and, and find if you want to bring an application for summary judgment on wrongful dismissal. With respect to uh, my paper today, I don't intend to read it. Uh, I uh, want to talk very generally about employment agreements, uh, to talk about why have them, uh, how are they created, and as well to highlight some of the more important terms uh, from my perspective uh, that should form part of uh, an employment agreement. Uh, with respect to uh, whether they're a good idea or not a good idea, uh, they're probably a good idea if you're dealing with an independent contractor and one wants to set out in clear terms what the role is of the individual, and you've got to remember Lord Wright's fourfold test in uh, Montreal locomotive and make sure that you've got that clearly in mind and that you have really created an independent contractor. Uh, that's one instance in which an employment contract, I think, is um, probably a good idea. With respect to non-independent contractors, um, from my perspective, it depends as to whether employment contracts are a good idea or not a good idea. I say that you end up with people who, if you're an employee, are entrepreneurial in spirit, uh, may want to take the risks involved in not having a contract. There are other people who think that certainty is really an important aspect of their lives, and they want to have everything nailed down every I dotted, every T crossed, they want to be assured of what it is they're going to get and what the terms and conditions of employment are going to be. And then obviously you may have employers who mandate it. So in that mix, um, I, I have a variety of opinions depending upon um, the person's make up, what the nature of the job is, whether it's going to be long term, short term, as to whether it's a good idea to have one or not. Part and parcel of that whole notion of not being able to give you a hard and fast rule as to whether they're a good idea or a not a good idea is that it's not one size fits all either. That is that the contract that may be useful and applicable for an administrative slash clerical kind of employee may not be applicable, useful, um, make any sense with respect to a middle management employee or a senior management employee or the CEO. And so if you're acting for a corporation and asked to draft an employment contract, you really need to know a whole lot more than just simply um, the fact that it's a company that makes widgets. You need to know what level of employee is it and uh, what's the nature of the job. I think that you ought to, if you're either drafting one for an employer or giving advice to an employee is to make sure that the nature of the job is truly reflected in the contract itself. And in, if in fact the idea is to have an employment agreement, you want to make sure, and this is critical, that in, in creating that contractual relationship that the employee has the employment agreement as an offer before they show up at work or before they start working. If you look in the material, and don't need to look it up now, but there's a case called Francis and the CIBC in which there was an exchange of correspondence between the individual and the bank in which the employee was offered a job and the employee took it. And the only condition of the job was that he provide an appropriate letter of reference. Sent in the appropriate letter of reference and he showed up for work and they gave him a whole bunch of documents to sign, one of which was an employment agreement that said if he was fired, he'd get three months notice. So he gets fired and he says, I'm entitled to 12 months notice. Employer waves around the agreement that he signed. He says, yeah, I probably read it. I didn't really pay much attention to it, but I probably read it and yeah, that's my signature. Employers relying on Wallace and the TD Bank, and the Court of Appeal says, too bad. You'd already had an agreement with them. You weren't entitled to have them sign this additional document because it wasn't part and parcel of the 
uh, offer an acceptance prior to his showing up for work. See, so it even gets more complicated if the employee actually is on the job, because there's no consideration. That's the way in which the court, the court of appeal in that case, Justice Weiler, dealt with the analysis. So if you are going to have an employment agreement, you really need to have it nailed down prior to the employee showing up for work. Now, um, with respect to um, some of the terms that uh, I think are important to take account of, one is, um, do you want the contract for a fixed period of time, or do you want the agreement to be at will? Pretty important, pretty critical uh, in terms of both the employer and the individual. I tend to act more for employees than I do for employers. I, I, I'm always leery about fixed term contracts because obviously at the end of the day, if the contract isn't renewed, the employee is not going to get anything. And so unless you build in a feature that will pay the employee for sticking out the three years, that is some kind of a balloon at the end of it, if it's not renewed, they just walk away from the agreement, got to look for a new job with no notice. Now, another way in which you can build notice into it would be to have a provision that deals with the requirement of one side or the other six months before the expiry of the agreement to enter into discussions about the renewal of it with some finalization of it, let us say four months before the agreement has expired. In that way, at least, the individual becomes apprised of the fact as to whether or not they're going to be on the street or whether or not uh, they're going to um, have a renewal. So that, that's, uh, it, it, from my perspective, uh, really quite important. Um, also, in terms of a fixed term contract, there are some advantages from the individual's point of view. If you enter into a four-year contract and you're fired after two, you should be able to assert that you're entitled to full payment on the balance. Now, you might want to build into the contract as to whether that balance is to be paid in a lump sum or is it salary continuance. As well, there is some debate about whether or not the employee is obliged to mitigate even though it's a fixed term contract. My view is he or she ought not to have to mitigate, but that's not a universally held view. And so there's a difference of opinion about that. And so if you've got the individual who wants the kind of certainty I talked about at the outset, you really better nail that feature of it down. Um, do you have to mitigate? And what's the effect of the, uh, of the mitigation? Um, then another uh, important term, obviously, is notice of termination. It's generally the first provision I, I turn to when an employee walks in with an employment contract to see how much notice they are going to get. And, um, you know, there are a number of ways in which employers and employees can deal with the appropriate amount of pay upon termination. It can be a fixed amount, that is 12 months pay, six months pay, TD and Wallace Bank, three months pay if you're, you're terminated can be a formula that might include the Employment Standards Act. That is, you get Employment Standards Act plus three months. Um, you're going to have sliding scales. That is, um, a month for each year of service uh, for your first five years, and then three weeks a year for each year of service thereafter, or vice versa. So you can have a whole multitude of different combinations to deal with um, how you will determine what the appropriate period of notice is. Another aspect is what's included in that calculation. Salary, bonus, benefits, will the employee get STD, short-term disability, uh, or long-term disability. Most employers will not provide those. Most insurance carriers don't allow employers to provide STD or LTD to persons who are no longer in the full-time employee of the employer. And so you may want to deal with that aspect of it in the contract. What about clubs and expenses if they've been covered? What about um, 
outplacement counseling. So what will go into the package in terms of the uh, dollar value? Another important feature is the stock option issue. Um, you really want to make sure that, that that's nailed down as to whether or not the, the, the stocks that haven't vested before the employee is terminated, but which would vest during the appropriate period of notice, would be part and parcel of what the employee is entitled to. You want to look at a case called Veer in the, the Court of Appeal on that, although it's not dealt with in a contractual setting as, as this talk is. Um, and then you might have a feature in it if you're on the employer side in terms of, of mitigating, um, saying that if the employee gets another job within the appropriate period of notice, they'll get 50 cents on the dollar on the balance. Another, um, let me just close with, with, with one item. I'm getting the hook here. Uh, change in control is another uh, item that um, is getting more prominence these days than in the past, and it's something to turn your mind to because it's more novel than some of the other provisions. And it's especially important with respect to senior executives, but it's also important with respect to small startup high-tech companies who may have recruited a person to come to work with them and the person has gone there because he or she likes the people that they are working with, they uh, like the owners, they like the gizmo that these high-tech folks are working on, and it may be that all of that changes as a result of a change in control. Maybe you get a new board of directors, maybe that the guy who's running the company, the, he or she, the CEO, uh, changes or the kind of gizmo that they're working on changes or is sold off. And what would that do with respect to whether or not the employee wants to stay on? So you got a four-year contract now working for a company that's got a different CEO than the one that recruited you and you're working on a different kind of gizmo. You're working on a witchy McCallit instead of a gizmo, you know, and you may not want to work on witchy McCallits. Change in control, what does that do? Does that allow you, under the terms of your contract, to say that's, that's a deemed termination. And if the answer to that's yes, you may get all of the rights under the termination clause, but you may build in another feature. That is, if there's a change in control, I will get an additional, the employee will get an additional 12 months pay and all of the benefits. So uh, change in control can be um, pretty important. Uh, the balance of what I had to say is in the paper. Thanks. Thank you, Chris. Because Mark's working his way up to the front. Mark and I had the, uh, I had the privilege of working with Mark for six years. And um, at times I'd like to say he was my junior, but more, but at times I, when he, when people come to my office, he's, I often hear that I was his junior. But uh, he did a lot of work. Uh, well, he was with us on the, his book on fiduciaries in between flying planes. Uh, I'd often ask where Mark was at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, and he'd be out learning to fly a plane. And then at 3 o'clock, he was working on his book. I was wondering when he was doing some billings. But uh, he always worked very, very hard. And it's my pleasure to introduce him. He's got a, one of these computer gizmo things, Mark? Indeed, Barry. All right. <coughs> That's what I was doing at 5 in the afternoon. <laughs> Good afternoon. Thanks, for, uh, thanks to Barry and uh, Howard for having me here today. Um, I basically learned everything I know from them, and that's what I tell the Law Society every time they call. <laughs> um, I've been asked to come here today and talk about fiduciary duties and update on that. That really involves basically one case, and that case has some pretty interesting factual connotations surrounding it. And I, I decided I would have a bit of a straw poll with, uh, with people here today. And I was going to do it by uh, punch ballot, but you know how that can go. So I'm going to do it by uh, show of hands and ask you, how many of you have applied for a job while gainfully employed elsewhere? And how many of you went and asked, uh, advised your employer in advance that you were doing that? And um, can any of you think of a word describing someone who does? Come. The word that comes to mind to me is loyal, brave, more stupid than anything. But what's interesting about that is that there is truly a duty 
of uh, disclosure to an employer, which our Court of Appeal has happened to make somewhat ripe very recently. This is the converse of that. This is a, a comic where, um, where the employer is approaching his employee and saying, um, do you know, it really uh, might advantage you to be working with the competition. So you can tell how uh, valuable that employee is. But as I say, the converse of that has been discussed by our Court of Appeal lately in a case that's called Felker. And you'll see here, this is from the, uh, from the post, and you can see from the headline, work where it happens, trend lines, disloyal employees in the law, and it says, don't presume you've never done it. Boss's door is closed, and the time is right to put the finishing gloss on your updated resume. While you're at it, you might as well run off a couple of copies on the, on the photocopier. And for your interview, no one will notice. Goes on to say, well, you'd better hope no one notices because our Court of Appeal apparently thinks that that is a rather large legal no-no. Similarly, the, <coughs> the um, excuse me, <coughs> the excerpt from the Globe and Mail indicates a similar sort of script. It says, court upholding, upholds firing of disloyal employee worker Man secretly pursues new job with rival. Well, this is not exactly earth-shaking that people would quietly go about their business looking to advance themselves in fine work elsewhere, but there is very clearly a whole brave new world attached to this new Felker and Cunningham ruling, one that's being oft discussed by many of you and certainly all of us in terms of how it affects the employment law sphere. And there's a couple of interesting quotes in here. This uh, suggests, uh, the court suggests that the engaging in closet negotiations is, uh, is the real uh, sin here. And you wonder whether or not uh, people are supposed to come out of the closet and tell their employers, and the straw poll told us how many of us would be willing to do it, should go to say to your employer, you know, I got this lead, thinking of pursuing it, need uh, tomorrow off, just at lunchtime, don't worry. And by the way, can I use the photocopier for, a, uh, for my resume? I don't think so. And in fact, as it turns out in this particular situation, this person did in fact use some company material, i.e. his laptop, in order to further his efforts to find reemployment. And in fact, uh, the employer took umbrage about, about uh, the absence of disclosure. David Harris and Bill Gale, two of our friends, of the three of us up here, and many of you indicated that they thought this, was, this ruling is somewhat consistent with the fiduciary duty owed by employees of uh, elevated nature. And I don't think any of us take, in the room take issue with that, that a, that a quasi-director, a very senior, senior manager, what we used to come to know as a top management structure person, would have certain elevated duties. <clears throat> However, if you <coughs> excuse me, I got a cold. <coughs> excuse me, if if you look down the ladder and looked at it, dealing with people at lower and lower levels, it really becomes somewhat frightening the impact of this decision, especially on the facts. And uh, David and and Bill were heard to say that um, there's a fiduciary duty is now so high that there cannot be even an appearance of conflict in the relationship whether or not the employer would, practically speaking, suffer a financial loss. So I guess the theory is, if you went out and you said to your employer, I'm going to leave, uh, or I'm going to go to an interview, please allow me, you go to the interview and you get the job, no, no true loss there, although our colleague George Vassos would say there's a wrongful resignation for failure to give notice, that, that's an interesting aspect of it, but on the whole would not suffer a financial loss, and yet our Court of Appeal is instilling a whole new issues surrounding this. Facts of Felker. Basically, the uh, employer met, uh, sorry, the employee met the plaintiff employer at an industry golf tournament, paid for his then employer, so obviously met him in a context which is somewhat si similar to his departure scenario. No one paid attention to that. Defendant contacted Felker about employment while Felker was gainfully employed elsewhere. Very competitive industry, says the court, with a high migration rate attached to the capacity of salesperson. No mystery to any of us. And defendant knew of desire to go independent prior to hiring him. And the background surrounding that is that apparently in this industry, like others, it's uh, of benefit to the individual to incorporate, become somewhat of a sales rep and an independent sales rep, 
and in that capacity um, peddle his wares. And in fact, that whole subject had been broached before hiring, and so that's what this individual was about to go and do when, uh, when nailed by his employer. I guess what the court leaps on, certainly not at trial, but at appeal level, is that there's the use of company property. I think all of us find this an, ingen an, an intriguing issue because people carry around their laptops or their, or their Blackberries or their pagers and use it as much for personal as for professional use. And m most employers that we know, some of us are more careful about it than others, but most employers that we know do not have specific rules and regulations surrounding using them. Not only that, it's terribly difficult for most employers to go home, do their work at home in the night and not maybe surf the web for interesting vacation spots or worse. Um, but in fact, when they're doing it, they're using employer-owned property. And in fact, unbeknownst to them, as we all seem to have become aware, someone is watching them. And there's nothing that happens on the web that an employer doesn't know about if it's an employer-sponsored uh, uh, internet service provider. One of the things that the Court of Appeal finds very interesting is that, or, or an excusatory of the defendant employer is, the defen it's, it admits, the employer admits, didn't go and say to the employee, look, I, I, I'm upset with you for doing this. Instead, just fired him. And the court finds, unlike what we would theorize often about what you should do in the, in the context of a uh, three strikes or out scenario, court said, well, that's his management style, this employer. This employer is more subtle and was not used to going and warning, so, hey, don't need to. That's debatable whether that's an important feature. Keep in mind what this person did. This person was not a vice president. This person was not a director. This person was not general manager. This person was not president. This person didn't belong or seek to be in the C-suite. This person was Toronto area sales manager albeit in a company that had only 60 employees, uh, but still keep in mind that this person was truly just a manager. If we step back from this particular case and look at the concept we're dealing with, um, the fiduciary concept brings with it many prescriptions about behavior um, that both Barry and, and uh, Howard would agree are somewhat sort of the, the four walls of fiduciary duty, at least I'm asking. <laughs> we always agree with you, Mark. <laughs> Highest duty known to law, says Justice Reed. There is no higher duty of anyone in any capacity. It is a director's duty. That's where it comes from. It comes from trust and confidence, and so it belongs at very high levels in very high degrees of authority. It's known as a duty of trust and confidence to act entirely selflessly in the best interests of another, the stuff of a, being a trustee. Uh, Justice Sapinka in Lack Minerals in cases that followed indicated that one of the tests that needs to, one of the things that needs to be uh, extant uh, is vulnerability to the excess of a transferred power. So where someone reposes power in another and becomes vulnerable to that misuse, that is at least one of the indicia of fiduciary power. And finally, the remedial power of equity in law is to be looked at because this is there, because it is the most powerful, mo highest duty known to law, it also brings with it the most powerful remedies. The judges simply say, we're not bound by any restriction in what we do to remedy this problem. We just fix it. We either turn back the clock, we, we deal with damages, we order certain things to be done with property or people, and in fact, understandably, because of the enormity of the issue, do not feel compelled to restrict themselves to conventional wisdom and remedy. The court said in, in uh, Canero, and this is still the leading case, seminal case in the area, indicated that there's a, a very high ethical standard for a director or senior manager. And in fact, you look at what the remedies tend to be in employment, and they tend to be that after resigning, a person is restricted from what they do. You very rarely have seen cases, there are some, but there's very rarely cases that dictate intra-employment action. And I, my thesis would be that in fact, 
some of these cases, especially the Felker uh, case, is dictating intra-employment obligation as, in terms of a remedy as opposed to what should happen in terms of restricting people after they depart. Again, the top management test is what evolved so that as opposed to it being a strict director's obligation, it's seen quite handily to translate into top management, typically the C-suite, uh, chief executive officers, etc. But we've had a bit of a change in, from LAC, and LAC is now quite an old case, and we have had a tremendous evolution of this concept. Um, and we had occasion some time ago to have the chancellor um, come from England and speak at the special lectures. I have uh, five minutes or three minutes? Well, or I'm, two I, minutes? I'm gonna go with three, then you have for sure five. And that's all I have to say, any questions? <laughs> Chancellor came to say that we are, and I'll cut to the chase, he calls us the land of Mounties, Beavers, and Fiduciaries because of how quickly and how readily we've taken to this concept and, and uh, taken it outside of the conventional wisdom. The confusion then comes from this kind of a quote from a BC judge who I met and quite like, and it's not probably a misquote, it's just the way it is. A review of the substantial jurisprudence suggests that the court will recognize a fiduciary relationship when it sees one, although it may not be able to say why, and it may not even call it that. Heady stuff. We have clearly gone with a, a pendulum swinging that says we used to talk about only directors, we've gone down right down to key employees who are, have access to a photocopier. And in fact, we were swinging way back the other way, understandably, because of trying to get back to where this thing should resonate. But in fact, now the Court of Appeal has probably turned that on its ear. My theory some time ago was that we have a bit of a tail wagging the dog theory going, and that is that courts are finding fiduciary concepts where they think they need a remedy. And of course, it would be much easier for them to look at other theories of law than to go to this most highest duty known to law. Got some precedents, which I won't bore you with. And I would talk a little bit about issues. Before this case, we had a pretty protected venue in terms of the hiring process. Certainly, employers are free to give uh, um, opinions about potential candidates without fear of legal suit, as long as they're doing it without malice. There is the freedom of livelihood issue that arises from the idea that we have to come out of the closet prior to uh, looking to change positions, which is very dangerous. We have the issue of contractual clarity. Clearly, this could all have been dealt with by the employer in advance, as we, the three of us, certainly recommend upon hiring. Certain prescripts of behavior and attitude could be put into the contract to greater or lesser effect. Hell Big Factor is a case many of you know. It's a case where an employer was found that he was pursuing his own patent in the context of remaining an employee. And this is somewhat dovetails with Felker in terms of our Court of Appeal thinking that many of the rights of employees are, are to be looked at uh, with less note than the rights of the employer to commercial enterprise. And I'm speeding along here. In, in the end, Felker himself lost his job, got no damages because at the trial judge was overturned by the Court of Appeal, and in fact, um, didn't get his new job. So he's left out there hanging. Consequences of Felker, this is a cartoon. Say, what sort of headhunting firm is this? Obviously, this will give rise in some respects to the advent of headhunters as a vehicle to go to, third party, confidential, out in the marketplace, and not on the employer's photocopier. It will also, this is a cartoon about a guy who puts, instead of pictures of his family, puts pictures of his clients on his desk. This will obviously mean a lot more work for us, which we're thankful for. And finally, food for thought. Whatever happened to the implied duty of fidelity, the tort of confidence, and the concept of good faith? These kind of issues resonate more <coughs> properly along the lines of implying some fidelity in the contract, looking for a tort of confidence in breaching the confidential nature of the employee-employer <coughs> relationship, or the concept of good faith that many of the practitioners are dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis as inherent in the employment relationship. Finally, one more comic, if you'll bear with me. This is a guy in the modern age. This is Dilbert and his boss. Dil boss says, can you help me reboot my computer? And uh, 
Dilbert says, you got to hold that above your head and shake it. And then he says to his colleague, I wonder if you'll ever catch on we gave him an extra sketch. <laughs> Thanks for your patience today. Mark, a, um, a fiduciary goes for an interview, says to the prospective employer, you can't tell my boss this or I'll get fired. The prospective employer says, don't worry, I won't. He, he tells anyway. The fiduciary gets fired for cause as per Felker. Right. Interesting action against the employer that disclosed the information. Oh, absolutely. And even if they don't say, please don't tell, there's an implied duty of confidentiality. So that might be the right of action that Felker didn't take. Well, I think that, oh, there's all kinds of bubble up that comes from this, Howard, and certainly, you know, this is under appeal, this case, Supreme Court, and we'll see how it goes. Mm -hmm. But um, it is definitely giving rise to all kinds of complications that we otherwise would not necessarily be dealing Has with. Has it got leave yet, or is it applying I, for leave? I'm not sure if it's received leave. Thanks. Thanks. Hey, Rolf, who's already been introduced. Speaking on obligations in the absence of an employment contract. Good afternoon. I suspect that I have one of the more mystifying topics on the agenda. Um, I must confess, uh, I thought that myself when the implied obligation that we all think about, of course, is the implied obligation to give reasonable notice of termination. And Barry Fisher is, in fact, uh, handling that topic. Uh, so what's uh, Hal Rolf going to talk about? And as I said, I had a bit of a problem myself so much so that in my paper, to try and say something topical, I put in, uh, topical and uh, timely, I put in uh, an employer's obligation to give time off during a federal election in the hope that at least somebody would draw something from what I had to say. Um, I will, however, uh, attempt to highlight a few points about implied obligations other than the obligation to give reasonable notice of termination in the hope that at least you won't end this with the question, what on earth is he talking about? The employer has uh, a number of uh, implied uh, obligations that are fairly, uh, fairly obvious. Uh, the employer is expected to provide work and employment. Um, increasingly, we have seen the courts uh, examining the employment relationship uh, and perhaps finding duties uh, that previously we were not sure were there. Uh, everyone's familiar with the Wallace case. Uh, while the court stopped short of saying there was a clear-cut obligation of uh, fairness, um, it's clear that uh, in the way the court handled that case, they have encouraged employers to uh, be fair and reasonable, or at least to meet minimum standards of fairness and reasonableness in dealing with employees, particularly at the time of, uh, of termination. Um, you can see in a number of cases how the courts uh, are looking uh, closely uh, at the obligations of an employer in a particular fact situation uh, and concluding that in some instances there may be more obligations than were previously thought. One case for me which is symptomatic of that was the uh, decision of uh, Madam Justice Epstein and Ditchburn and Landis and Gear. In that case, um, a 27-year employee was fired for cause after, contrary to company policy, he drove while inebriated, and I believe it ended up getting into a fist fight um, with uh, a key customer of the employer. Uh, Madam Justice uh, Epstein found that wasn't cause for uh, termination and her judgment was upheld on appeal. And she had some interesting things to say, I thought, about the employment contract uh, from the perspective of uh, the employer's obligations. She said it, it is a transitional contract in which each of the employer and employee can reasonably expect more from each other as the relationship continues. So the, the suggestion there is that as the employment relationship continues, uh, the obligations may be greater. Um, she went on to say, in the particular context, um, the employer 
uh, owes the employee more than the benefit of the doubt. In a situation such as this, it owes a response of loyalty, support, and then additional support if the employee proves to have a problem for which he or she requires specialized assistance. One other issue that increasingly I think uh, we're forced to consider when we're advising uh, employers and employees is does the employer have an implied obligation to give a letter of reference at the conclusion of the employment relationship? I think the law still is there's not an implied obligation to give a reference, but if you don't, the court can look, in that, look at that as an indice of bad faith or conclude that more notice is required because the employee is going to have a more difficult time in finding uh, uh, new employment. So in an indirect way, you can find the courts, in effect, putting greater obligations on the employer. Let's turn to the employee. Uh, what are the, uh, the employee's implied obligations? Well, the employee clearly has an implied obligation to work and to be available for work subject to the proviso that short-term absences due to illness or other factors beyond the control are not going to end the employment relationship. That obligation really is uh, uh, the foundation of the doctrine of frustration that we sometimes look at where it's clear the employee uh, is unable to work, has been unable to work for a considerable period of time and the prospect is that the employee won't be coming back in the foreseeable future. Now, with respect to the doctrine of frustration, you can't look at that anymore in simple common law terms because we have a human rights code. The human rights code prohibits discrimination on the basis of handicap and also creates a positive duty to accommodate. And you can't really deal with frustration uh, without having con consideration of the human rights code, the duty of obligation, you may also have to consider the Workplace Safety and Insurance Act because there the employee has a reinstatement right and there are financial consequences for the employer if that right is, uh, is, is breached. So in that area, really statute I think uh, is probably more important than, uh, than the common law. An employee has an implied obligation to give reasonable notice of resignation. And it's interesting because there are, in fact, a few cases around, not very many, but there are a few around on the obligation to give reasonable notice of resignation. The courts, when they deal with the issue, look at some of the same factors that we do in uh, assessing reasonable notice. What position did the employee hold? Um, what was the employee's length of service? Um, then they'll turn their attention to how long will it take an employer to uh, find a replacement. Unlike the situation that obtains with respect to the issue of giving reasonable notice of termination, the cases dealing with reasonable no the obligation to give reasonable notice of resignation are much fewer. And it's much more difficult in looking at those cases to deduce what is the appropriate amount of notice of resignation. There's been a fairly recent case from uh, our Court of Appeal, Bradley and uh, Carlton Electric, where the Court of Appeal upheld a trial judge's finding that an 18-year employee who was in a fairly key position was required to give three months' notice of resignation, and uh, the failure to, to give that notice uh, entitled the employer, in this case, to $10,000 in damage. There's another uh, case, uh, Madam Justice Chapnick, Sure Grip, Fastener, and All Grade Bolt and Nut, where uh, she assessed the longest period of, uh, not of notice of resignation that I've seen, but the scenario there is somewhat unique. What you had was a general manager and two salespeople. While in employment, uh, they decided they would, would go off and compete with the, uh, the employer. And accordingly, it's one of the types of situations that Mark Ellis was talking about um, where there were fiduciary overlaps. But in that case, uh, Madam Justice Chapnick found that the general manager, who she classed as being a fiduciary, 
was supposed to give six months notice and that each of the sales reps should have given a month and a half and in terms of the sales reps i think she looked to how much time it took the employer to find replacements there's another case where the employer's action for damages for failure to give reasonable notice of resignation was dismissed in that case you had a fifteen year technician who gave the employer ten working days notice two weeks i think he subsequently offered thirty hours of technical service to help out and uh, said he'd be available to train a replacement for five days the court in that case found that that was sufficient and denied the employers claim for damages the damages for the failure to give notice of resignation are not the damages sustained by the employer because it loses the employee it's comparable to the failure to give reasonable notice what you lose by failure to receive the notice in other words if the employer uh, loses business because he doesn't have the employee available during the period of notice that may give rise to um, a claim for damage the employer has to however prove that he would have avoided certain costs uh, or would have sustained recovered certain amounts if the employee had continued to work during the notice period the employer also has an obligation to mitigate uh, by seeking a replacement clearly these cases do not arise uh, frequently obviously uh, damages may be difficult to uh, to compute for the employer and moreover the employer clearly uh, has the offset in that it doesn't have to pay the employee after the employee uh, leaves and that's a reduction there's probably another reason that um, these cases never get very far generally speaking when I get a call from one of my employer clients about an employee resigning the employers concern is not that the employee has given insufficient notice of resignation the concern is he's going he may be going to a competitor quasi competitor they want him out the door as quickly as possible and ask me well you know can we just tell him to leave now and I have to say well not really because the Court of Appeal in a case called Dustbane and Oxman held that if an employee offers to resign uh, the employer either accepts the resignation on its terms ie allows them to work out six months if that's what the employee is given or if the employer wants to terminate then the employer has to give reasonable notice of termination the notice of resignation can't be waived by the employer what's the the real point I draw from all of this my view is that if the employer is concerned about getting adequate notice of resignation what it ought to do is tell the employee preferably at the time of hiring or uh, through the issuance of uh, policies and procedures. I tend to think that if the employer has made it clear what type of uh, notice of resignation it, it expects, if it's reasonable, and I think uh, if you're talking more than 30 days notice, you're going to be outside of the realms of reasonableness. But if the employer indicates roughly what it wants, I suspect most courts, if faced with the issue, would find that that was reasonable. An employee has an implied duty of good faith and fidelity. That will uh, assist the employer in some circumstances in finding uh, cause. Now, some of it's obvious. Clearly, an employee shouldn't steal. Uh, and if he does, uh, absent extenuating circumstances, uh, the employer is probably entitled to terminate. Um, one case that uh, is fairly recent where uh, it demonstrated the utility in some circumstances of the duty of fidelity is a decision uh, called Spend Love and Thorn and Ernst uh, and Winnie. And in this case, it was an office manager employed in an accounting firm. The partner in the accounting firm where she worked encouraged her, in fact, required her to engage in certain illegal activities. I see I'm getting the hook. Um, the result um, was when it came to light, she was terminated. She argued, I was just doing what my superior asked me to do. The court held that um, her duty of fidelity required her to recognize uh, 
that what she was doing was contrary to the employer's interest uh, and that she should not have comp complied with the request from the superior. So the overriding duty, in, in fact, gave the employer uh, cause. Another area that I just want to briefly touch upon, because we sometimes forget it, uh, an employee, when uh, he or she applies for a job, is taken to have warranted that the employee is capable of uh, performing the employment obligations for which the employee is being hired. And there is support in the case law that if an employee um, breaches um, his or her duty of care in relation to the employer, in other words, carries out the duties negligently, the employee may in fact be liable in damages to the employer. Uh, the leading case is a House of Lords decision called uh, Lister and Romfield Ice and Cold Storage. In that case, an employer was allowed to sue a driver whose negligence had rendered the employer liable uh, uh, in uh, damages to uh, the individual who had been struck by the driver's car. There have been Canadian cases that have looked to, uh, to Lister and applied it. Um, a number of years ago, uh, Mr. Justice Lissaman, in a case that I think was called O'Grady, uh, found that a controller uh, who had screwed up um, in his duties uh, with the employer um, finding itself subject to uh, penalties and extra assessments under the Income Tax Act for not making the appropriate remittances uh, could be required uh, to uh, pay back the uh, employer for those, uh, uh, those extra assessments that the employer uh, found itself liable for as a result of the employee's uh, uh, dereliction of duty. Those cases are relatively rare. Uh, I tend to think that if the court saw a plethora of uh, claims against employees for negligence, they would find ways to, uh, to limit them. I don't have the time to go into it, but there is a case that I referred to in our paper uh, called London uh, Drug, Kuhn and Nagel, where it's an insurance case, and uh, in that case, an employee who was sued uh, by the customer of a warehouse was able to take the advantage of the employer's um, limitation of liability, and it's, it's primarily a privity of contract uh, type of case and expanding the notion of who can take uh, the benefit of a, uh, an exclusion of liability clause. But there are a number of dicta in the case which suggest that the courts may be sensitive to employees who uh, find themselves uh, being sued. Uh, where I think in practice the issue may be uh, useful to consider is where you have an employee uh, who's in a position that's sensitive, such as being a controller, who screws up um, big time, and the employer uh, finds itself not being in a position where it can give the adequate warnings, putting the employee on notice that his performance must improve, the employer will feel, uh, uh, in many cases, obliged to terminate quickly. Um, these cases that deal with the employer, employee's implied uh, duty of competence um, may allow the, uh, the employer, when faced with the action for wrongful dismissal, to counterclaim for damages. Tactically, it may be a way to get out of a difficult situation where you haven't gone through the proper steps to try and prove cause based on performance. Um, lastly, I will mention that there is an implied duty of confidentiality if an employee receives trade secrets or information that it knows the employer regards as being confidential and that information is not in the public domain, the employee is expected to maintain the confidentiality. And that obligation extends after the uh, end of the employment relationship. The difficulty with relying on the implied duty of confidenti confidentiality, however, is there may be an issue about what is really covered by it and what is confidential. Again, the, uh, the conclusion I draw is that if an employer is concerned about it, the employer ought to have the employee sign a confidentiality agreement. That way, what is confidential can be defined, and from a practical perspective, the fact that the employee has signed the agreement is more likely to, uh, 
cause the employee to be sensitive to his or her obligations. Thank you. Mark Geiger is now going to speak on dealing with independent contractors, our little time out from the employment law aspects of the talk to the, to the um, Proudy Millennium's largest growing alternative, independent contractors, if they're really independent contractors. Mark heads the Labor and Employment Law Group at Blaney McMurtry and started his career with the firm of Stringer Brisbane. He's been doing He's had a very active practice in all aspects of labor and employment law for his entire career. Thanks very much, Art. First of all, uh, let me say that uh, uh, it used to be that this would have been an aside. Uh, I think that that's no longer the case because, as I'm going to discuss in a few minutes, the line between employees and independent contractors is, to say the least, anything but clear. Let me first of all also apologize to you for not having the paper I had uh, promised to get. Some uh, personal factors made it impossible for me to uh, get it done in time. It's in the process and you will get it, but not today. So let me start off by uh, talking about what do we mean by the term independent contractor. And I think if you ask the average Joe on the street what he meant, he'd say, well, a guy who works for himself. And then if you pressed a little further, you might find it more difficult to define. Of course, we can go back to the uh, well-known uh, Montreal locomotive case, a decision of the Privy Council in, I think, 1947, which I think is still good law, which sets forth a, a four-fold test to determine whether or not someone is an independent contractor or an employee. And as I go through the four, you'll see that all of these are questions of fact, control, ownership of the tools, chance of profit, risk of loss. Those are the four tests. But they're not anywhere near as clear as one might think once one starts to parse out what do we mean by control. Well, how much control is enough control? Control of what? Let me give you a couple of uh, cases that I actually dealt with over uh, the last few years. One of them involved a, a very uh, uh, big film producer who produces a great deal of animation. And the way in which the animation is produced is somebody writes a story and somebody does what's called a storyboard which kind of shows how the animation will proceed and someone draws the characters that are going to be used in the story and then the, the storyboard and the story are given to a whole series of artists and in Canada they would draw uh, one frame and then a frame ten frames from that which for you would be a little less than half a second away and another one and any time that there was a change in scene, they would draw the change of scene and then 10 frames from then. And then all those sets of frames would be sent over to Korea and the people in Korea would draw the nine cells in the middle. And they had a whole series of people who worked at tables, uh, which were called uh, light tables for obvious reasons. Some of them were employees and some of them were independent contractors. Some of them had corporate names, some of them didn't. They were all artists and they were all very good artists and they all drew. And they had about 150 of these people. And they had had them doing this for a whole series of years. And Income Tax Canada came along and said, and they, in, uh, Tax Canada came along and said this because one of the film industry unions had decided that they wanted to try to organize these folks. So they alleged that they were employees. And they sicked Revenue Canada on the company. So Revenue Canada comes in, looks at this and says, you got Joe Blow sitting at this table doing exactly the same job. He's being played as an employee. This person, they may have a, an independent company, uh, and you're paying them as an independent contractor. We don't buy it. You owe us four years of uh, CPP plus a penalty, three years of EI, both your contribution and the employee's contribution, plus we're going to be looking uh, for you if we're short on tax for any of these people for three years. I don't need to tell you that the amount of money that was involved in there was astronomical. This company had been following this practice since time immemorial, and virtually every other uh, uh, company in Canada that hires people in the film industry has a similar kind of practice. So what happened? Well, we got to the day before the tax court hearing, and, it, uh, and uh, the government of Canada at the time was introducing legislation in Parliament on the status of the artists. 
and we went the political back door and talked to the minister and said, look, do you really want to be doing this on the very day you're introducing this legislation? And they dropped the case. Now, were they right or were they wrong? I'll leave that for you to decide. In my judgment, we had a tough battle. I was acting for the producer in, in convincing on any of the tests that were available that these people were, in fact, independent contractors. And yet that is the practice that had been in that industry for years and still is, by the way. Uh, another case uh, involving shingling industry. Roofing contracting companies are set up around, the, there's about maybe 12 or 15 major contractors, maybe not quite that many, two or three real big ones in the city of Toronto and surrounding area. The way in which they, they uh, do this is they contract with the, uh, with the homeowners, which are usually building you know, subdivisions of a couple of hundred or 600 homes at a time, and they say, we'll do your roofs. They then contract with uh, what is called in the industry uh, a, a uh, crew leader, and the crew leader says, well, I'll do six homes, or another crew leader says, I'll do 15 homes. They buy the shingles. Um, the, we supply the shingles. We take them to the site. They, we supply the nails. They supply the workers and the hammers, and they put the, they put the uh, roof on, and they get paid so much per square. That's for every 100 square feet, they get paid a certain amount, and they get paid depending on what the, uh, on what the pitch is. And they take the money and they divide it amongst their crew as they see fit. The roofing contractors pay to the crews uh, a fixed fee, which is determined by this loose negotiation that's been going on for many years. In any event, uh, that was the subject of about a year's worth of hearings at the Ontario Labor Relations Board as to whether or not these people were independent contractors or employees. And if they were employees, whose employees were they? And as you may know, and I'll come to this in a minute, there's a test under the, under the Ontario Labor Relations Act which talks about dependent contractors. A dependent contractor is a, an independent contractor, if you will, at law, uh, but whose relationship with the, uh, well, here's the actual definition. It means a person, whether or not employed under a contract of employment and whether or not furnishing tools, vehicles, equipment, machinery, or material, or any other thing owned by the dependent contractor, and who performs work or services for another person for compensation or reward, and here's the operative part, on such terms and conditions that the dependent contractor is in a position of economic dependence upon and under an obligation to perform duties for that person more closely resembling the relationship of an employee than that of an independent contractor. So the key here is economic dependency. And if you know anything about the construction industry, you'll know that people like these crews that I was talking about are to some extent economically dependent upon the contractor that gives them the work, uh, which in this case were my clients. So we had a big, huge battle at the, at the Labor Relations Board that went on for about a year. To make a long story short, the test is so ambiguous that we ended up entering into a three-way agreement, an agreement between the union, my clients, and the crew leaders, a three-way agreement not contemplated by the Act, but brokered, by the way, by one of the vice chairs of the Act, and then set up as a settlement under the Act, therefore binding even though it might not be a collective agreement, uh, and we settled the issue at the Labor Board. Then Revenue Canada got involved. And they came in and made the same kind of pitch uh, as in the case I had just outlined to you, uh, dealing with uh, film producers. Again, we managed to convince them that these people were independent contractors. And the main reason I suggest to you that we did that was political. It would have created chaos in the housing industry. And this particular group of individuals had demonstrated on many occasions that they were prepared to withdraw their services and shut down the, the housing industry in Metro for any length of time required, had they been found to be um, dependent contractors, or, it more, or, or in terms of the Act, employees and therefore subject to CPP, EI, income tax, and all the rest of it. So the test is anything but clear. And in the last few years, it's, been, it's my clear impression that companies more and more and more are uh, after downsizing or right-sizing. Instead of hiring employees when things have got better, they've outsourced, I think that's the common term, or hired quote-unquote contract employees. And individuals have entered into these agreements 
where they say we're an independent contractor, tax is not deducted at source, neither is EI, neither is CPP. They enter into a contract which is set up as an independent contractor. And yet all of those tests, all of those assumptions could be overturned by a court or by a statutory tribunal under any number of acts uh, if the facts don't bear up to the analysis. So let's, I want to talk just very briefly about the risks, and I've made reference to some of them. Let's talk about some of the others. Um, there's a number of cases uh, with Beckers and Max Milk that went through the courts, started either under the Employment Standards Act or started under the Workers' Compensation Act as it was then, uh, now the WSIB. Um, or, in fact, it could be started under the Employment, uh, under the uh, Pay Equity Act. It could start under almost any employment statute, as it, because most of these statutes either apply or don't apply, or at least apply differently, in, depending on how you make this characterization. And many of the statutes don't have any test, and the tests are not consistent from one statute to another. So let's, let's talk about some of the risks you run. One you might not think of. Most of you, and you've probably heard about Hodge and employment standards and the fact that if you have an employment, if you have an employment contract that doesn't comply uh, with the Employment Standards Act in terms of notice and other requirements, uh, then you can, uh, then that term of notice will be ruled out. And there's a recent case that in fact says it doesn't matter whether it applies now, if it, if it will ever contravene the act, then, it, then it's void ab initio. In other words, the person may only be entitled to two weeks right now, but if down the, down the line you might be entitled to eight weeks and you've only given four, that term is contra of the contract is void ab initio even though you haven't uh, not complied at this stage of the game. So it's very common for people to enter into, into these quasi-employment contracts and set a notice of 30 days. Arguably, they run the risk of having that contract challenged by the plaintiff, saying, no, this really wasn't. I, I was forced into this. I really didn't. I wanted to be. I'm really an employee. Have the, uh, that contract or have that term uh, ruled void because there's a finding that they were, in fact, an employee, and then have their, uh, their notice period determined by the principles under the common law, under wrongful dismissal law. And in fact, there's, there's cases on the, rec on the books right now that do exactly that. So that's one risk you run. The second risk you run I've already mentioned is the risk of non-payment of CPP, non-payment of EI. The employer takes the risk here. Uh, you'll note that under CPP, uh, the employee is required to remit 1.8% up to the maximum, and the employer is required to remit 1.8% up to the maximum. If you don't remit on behalf of the employee, then not only are you eligible for the 1.8% as an employer back four years, but you're also eligible for a penalty of either 10% under any circumstance or 20% if it was done knowingly. I could go on with other, uh, with other uh, risks, but let me just list the statutes that you need to be concerned about, you need to be familiar with when you're giving either an employer or a prospective ind independent contractor advice that they need to take into account. CPP and EI for the reasons I've given you. Income tax, obviously. Income tax deducted at source or not. If you don't deduct at source, you're responsible if it's not paid and there's also a penalty. WSIB, someone is or is not eligible for benefits, perhaps, and they may dispute it. Ontario Labor Relations Board, if you're an independent contractor, you're not eligible for unionization. If you are a dependent or employee, you are. Employment standards only applies to employees, not to independent contractors. If you are not paying people overtime and someone's found to be uh, a, a, an employee, not an independent contractor, you're going to owe them the money. Pay equity, if you don't take these people into account when you do your pay equity calculations and they turn out to be employees, then your pay equity plan could be void, although the chances of that happening I think now are probably much less than they were. And one last thing, of course, GST. If they are independent contractors and they're being paid more than $30,000 in total by anybody, then they must have a GST number and you must deduct and remit, not deduct, you must, you must pay them GST and you must have them recording a GST number which they then remit to Revenue Canada. Lastly, pension plans. 
you're not eligible if you're an independent contractor. Sorry for that, uh, but it's an awful lot to try to cover in 15 minutes. I always enjoy this topic because you always find the lawyers who are tax partners till they get fired. And um, I always enjoy lawyers who come into my office and they want to bring an action, they go and file for UI and, or employment insurance and uh, things start to unravel, especially at the smaller firms. So be wary. Right. Uh, no, it doesn't. Well, <clears throat> it means that you could contract. If they were truly an independent contractor, then you could contract with them to give them no notice. If you don't contract with them, in other words, if they don't have a written contract and they're still an independent contractor, the courts have started to apply a quasi-employee test, and they will they will imply the same kind of notice as they would imply with an employee. Although, in my view, the notice will be somewhat less than it would be with a similar employee. But the risk you run is if you do that and they challenge it and they're found to actually be an employee, then your then your clause is out the window and you're back to the common law for the uh, for the period of notice, which the court would think would be appropriate. Guy at the back. Well, I haven't seen a case exactly on point, but my opinion is you're probably likely to find that you're both employers in that circumstance. I know of one case in, uh, where an employee was uh, in Canada. Uh, he was paid in Canada, but the court found that he was also an employee of the American parent uh, because he had some responsibility to report to that American parent and therefore found the American parent liable uh, even though the parent because the, uh, the, the main employer in Canada had gone bankrupt. I don't think it would be much of a stretch in a circumstance where someone was really an employee. And I know they do this. A lot of accounting is done this way. You hire an accountant. Well, they come and work in your office. They come to work when you tell them to. They use your adding machine. There's no risk of loss. There's no chance of profit. They're an employee at, at common law. And I, so I think they would be eligible to sue both of you, both the agency uh, the only case I know of directly on point is actually a case uh, under the Labor Relations Act which dealt with nurses who were being hired by hospitals and determining whose employee they were. But I don't know that that would apply to the common law. But there have been cases that have said that under the common law. So we're going to be having questions at the end of the day and we're 25 minutes over past our break right now. So why don't we take it? <laughs>